All right, good evening, everyone. This is the Administrative Charging Committee's first meeting. Um, I'm Kiana Kinsler, the Executive Secretary, and at this time we'll let all the members introduce themselves. I'm Paul Rivers. I'm Samantha Phillips Chester. Octavia Kidd, good evening. Chris Gallant. Sean Lamb. Thank you. And then we're going to follow the agenda. So we're going to vote. Everyone's going to cast their vote for the chairperson. Whoever they vote for the whoever they vote to be the chairperson. Um, Mr. Rivers, we'll start with you. <laughs> and vote for me. Okay. I'm sorry, you, you said you're going to me? No. Oh, okay. We're Wait, before, like before we start that, what is the roles and responsibilities of the oh, chairperson? Does anybody know that before we vote? I mean, I mean, okay. you know, you want to do that. Yeah, I have the okay. I have the I have the reg because it comes right from the reg. Yep. Yeah. Good, good, good question. question. You know. So, well, do we need to have a formal nomination, though? Um, is that what we have to do? No, we're just going to vote. Yeah. Okay. The, in addition to what's, oh. So, uh, under Comar, uh, chairman of the ACC, uh, or chairperson, will be chosen by the members. Uh, the chairperson must follow Robert's rules of order. Um, and the responsibilities include establishing meeting schedule, with a minimum of one meeting per month, uh, establishing a written agenda for the meeting and disseminating it to the other members in advance, all the meeting, the order, uh, coordinating the meeting um, in compliance with the agenda, initiating discussion among members uh, before voting on any of the motions, uh, other responsibilities, in inviting motions, seconds, and votes from members, um, ensuring that record all the ACC businesses are kept. Um, there are the Coma regulations that require certain things to be kept for certain periods of time. Uh, certainly, the uh, Open Meetings Act has similar requirements. And uh, reporting to the ACC jurisdiction, um, basically the council and the uh, uh, PAB, um, any concerns regarding basically certain events that members. ACC members have to report them to affect their eligibility. Um, and it's all sort of listed in coma. I'm, I'm guessing you all the training that we covered, yes. mm -hmm. covered some of those things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's running the meeting, setting, setting the agenda, um, which is consistent with the Robert's Rules of Orders any, anyway. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. So, I guess I got to say it again. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, Paul Rivers, vote for Paul Rivers. I, Samantha Phillips Chester, vote for Paul Rivers. <laughs> Octavia Kidd, voting for Paul Rivers. Okay. Chris Gallant, voting for Paul Rivers. Okay. Mr. Lamb, voting for Paul Rivers. Congratulations, Mr. Rivers, Rivers Chair. Thank you, guys. I will do my best to be as professional as I can. As long as y'all don't mess me up, no. <laughs> and, and we're a team here. That's right. Don't forget, we're only as weak, we're only as strong as our weakest person. And I'm just kind of weak, but no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but we're we're all a team. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we we'll table. Yeah, and then so I had went out of order, so now everybody can introduce themselves. So okay. Table team. So introduce themselves again. Yeah. All right. Like I guess provide some background information. I think. Second thing. Steven's going to introduce himself to you. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to start with um, our attorney, Steve. Would I'm, you please introduce yourself and your I'm responsibilities? My name is Steve Yeager. I'm an attorney here in the uh, Howard County Office of Law, and I've been assigned to represent the Administrative Charging Committee for Howard County. Samantha? Yep. Uh, Samantha Phillips Chester. I am an appointed member of the Administrative Charging Committee. Um, I'm currently the director of 
Prince George's County Office of Child Support and in the Department of Human Services. That's good. Ms. Octavia. Good evening, Octavia Kidd. I am appointed by County Executive Calvin Ball. I am a public servant, spent the last decade in public safety, and now I'm here to serve my community here in Howard County. Yes. I'm Chris Gallant. I was voted uh, as a member of the ACC by the POB. Um, I own and operate a company by the name of Alternative Capital Funding here in Howard County, and I am eager to serve the community in this capacity. Okay. Sean? Hello, my name is Sean Lamb. I am the Associate Director of Howard Pride at ACC, which is a Minority Male Leadership Program. I was appointed by Dr. Calvin Ball to be a part of the AAC committee. Um, here to serve. My name is Paul Rivers. I'm on, also on the PAB, appointed here by the chairperson of the PAB um, to be on the ACC. I am a member of the community and I do a lot with the Howard County, which I represent District 4 for the PAB. And uh, welcome everybody. And um, I know we'll do good things together. And I think next on our on Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. sorry no, that's part of my introduction. But um, yeah, my name is John Peterson. Uh, I'm a uh, assistant um, chief administrative officer here with the county. And my role and Michelle Bailey Hedgepath, who you may have met as well, uh, our roles are to support Kiana and to support you and the PAB in any way we can. Thank you. So we'll please Yeah. Okay. Well, since you're standing up, sir, would you go ahead with your presentation, please? It's up here. And I'll go through this kind of quickly because I think you've had a lot of this information already, but I think it's important that we just set the stage for your committee and, and what your responsibilities are. So again, you are the Howard County Administrative Charging Committee. And what is it that you as a committee do? So you are the body that uh, reviews investigations that affect, affect a, um, a member of the public. You help determine the charges and you issue, a, a, you issue the opinions or the, and the suggested discipline to the, either the, the police chief or the sheriff. So your requirements, I think you all know those, you uh, need to submit to a background investigation, you, completely, you need to complete the training, which you all have now, which is great and sign the confidentiality agreement, which I believe Kiana has passed out and hopefully everyone's completed those and we'll still have to get one more. But um, so the, that's that certifies all of you to be then members of sitting members of the administrative charge committee. And who makes up the committee? Um, as you all said, when you started, some of you are appointed by the uh, county executive. Some of you are appointed by the police accountability board. And then Paul and his role is designated by the chair of the police accountability board. So it's a, it's a mixed way of being appointed. Um, but all of everybody in this group is appointed to the board by someone. And so far, what's happened with the administrative charging committee? So members have been appointed and selected. Uh, you guys have had the training. You've had your first joint meeting with the police accountability board. We've updated a county webpage site for the administrative charging committee and all your meetings, agendas, all that information will be posted on that. So if you go to the Howard County um, website, there's a, a slot for boards and commissions. And the very first one is the administrative charging committee. If you click on that, that'll have information related to your meetings, your agendas, and anything that's going on with the committee. And who's the staff that supports you? Well, of course, you all know Kiana very well. She is your main point of contact. She is the executive secretary and the liaison to the police, I mean, to both the police accountability board and the administrative charging committee. And then myself and Michelle Bailey Hedgepath, uh, we work in the Office of County Administration and we're here to support also in any way we can. So key duties um, for the liaison, that's Kiana. Uh, she's a training coordinator. She makes sure that you guys have all the applicable trainings required. If anybody new comes on the board to make sure they have the trainings. Uh, she works with the, um, um, what's it called, the police, uh, the gentleman from the, who gave you the presentation. She coordinates with him if there's any tra training that needs to happen and make sure that we have that. She's also your record keeper. So she maintains all the meeting information. She records the minutes. Uh, she keeps any the log of any correspondence that needs to happen. Anything that flows from the committee, usually the chair will then instruct Kiana, and Kiana will make a request or send information out. 
Uh, she'll also be your point of contact for sending out meeting notices, agendas, things like that. Um, and then end of your reporting, any reporting that needs to happen, uh, the PAB does an annual report. She's responsible for helping coordinate that report and making sure that that gets out. Okay. Open Meetings Act training, I won't go over because Steve is going to give you the full Open Meetings Act training, but just uh, you are required to have Open Meetings Act training before you go into a closed session, which most all of your true meetings will be, will be in closed session. You have to have somebody who's gone through the training and can, can take you into a closed meeting. Thanks. All right, how do the three groups work together? So there's a Police Accountability Board, your committee, the Administrative Charging Committee, and then possibly a trial board. So the Police Accountability Board, they're the intake. They take the complaints. Uh, they appoint members to this body. They uh, look at trends in policing and, and complaints. So they'll do, the, and they'll do that end of year report. Uh, and they are they're tasked with meeting both with the police and the sheriff regularly, and also with youth members of the community. The Administrative Charging Committee then reviews those complaints and determines charges based on that disciplinary uh, matrix that you all have received. You meet monthly to look at any cases, uh, and then you, you make recommendations for discipline. The trial board is what could happen after you've made a recommendation for discipline. So uh, the, you'll make a recommendation for discipline based on that charging matrix to the chief or to the sheriff. They can give that discipline or give higher discipline. They can't give lower than what you've recommended. And then if the officer or the deputy chooses not to accept that discipline, they can go to a trial board. And the trial board is a civilian member appointed by the PAB, a sitting judge, and then an officer of equal rank or a sheriff's deputy to equal rank uh, of the person charged. Okay. So how does our process work? So basically a complaint comes in, it can go straight to the police or sheriff or come in through the PAB. It's then given to the appropriate uh, investigative arm, either the internal affairs or the sheriff has their own internal affairs. They'll actually conduct the investigation. During the investigation process, any complainant is assigned an advocate to work with them through the process. So they have somebody from the um, who can help them navigate, if, you know, and keeps them informed of where the charges are, what's going on with the process. And then it comes to the administrative charging committee. Uh, either the IAD or the sheriff's department will bring that here and give you kind of the, the synopsis of the report. Um, you then have an opportunity to ask for more information, to subpoena information, to look at body worn camera information, uh, and then make a decision. Uh, and then you'll have to issue a written decision on that, uh, on what your recommendation is. And then that discipline again goes to the chief of the sheriff. They can then offer that to the, to the employee and the employee can accept it or refuse it. If they refuse it, it goes to the trial board process. Uh, the complaint form, that's just, uh, we have it set up electronically on our website. The complaint comes in. Uh, the police also have a separate, uh, and the sheriff has a separate complaint process. But uh, uh, any complaint that comes in has to be handled whether it comes through the process or not. Uh, a plain, complaint cannot become, cannot come in anonymously, although if the police gets an anonymous complaint, they'll still investigate it, but it's not necessarily part of this process. It has to be a, a uh, somebody can do it on behalf of a, of a, Complainant, but uh, it has. We have to have a name on the complaint. It does not need to be notarized. Uh, it can have additional information, uh, but we don't accept like video information on the actual complaint form or the complaint process. But they can they can submit that to the police or the sheriff. Uh, again, I just think I touched on this. It, it cannot be anonymous. Um, if the complaint comes in, it's got to go. We've got to give it right to the police or the sheriff within three days. Um, as soon as we get it, and then can it include videos or pictures? It doesn't have to. We can't accept them in our portal, uh, but the, you know, if somebody makes a complaint, the police will investigate it, and they'll get any additional information that the, the complainant has. Next. All right, your functions. Again, let's get a little redundant, but you review the findings. Whatever comes in, you're going to review those findings. They're going to give you a report, uh, and they'll you know present it to you and walk you through the report. You decide whether or not you want to charge the, per, the, the officer or the, or the sheriff. Um, you want to um, decide if you're going to charge them, what the level of discipline is. Uh, you use the matrix. There's a little bit of wiggle room in the matrix. I think you know as if you know there's additional circumstances that you can go up or down a little bit. You can review any information. Uh, you can ask for body camera footage. Uh, you can ask for the officer or the sheriff to come before you with a re representative. 
Um, and then you issue that written op opinion that, that details what your findings are. And then that opinion goes to, again, the sheriff or the uh, chief of police. And then how are your decisions made? Again, you're following that disciplinary matrix. Uh, you'll, you'll look at that matrix. You'll look at any prior charges that the officer or the deputy sheriff has had. Uh, you'll look at the severity of the, of the um, charge, and then you use that matrix to uh, assess the recommended discipline. And then again, based on aggravating or mitigating factors, you can go up a little or down, but you have to pr stay pretty much in line with the, the disciplinary matrix. And then the trial board, again, what's the purpose? Again, they're kind of the, the next to last chance or the last chance of the PAB process for an officer or a deputy sheriff. Um, it gives them an opportunity to appeal uh, a decision made by the ultimately the chief or the sheriff who's issuing that that discipline, um, and then that's the end of the PAB process. It, if at the end of that process uh, they disagree with the decision of the trial board, they can still take it to circuit court, but that's out of our process at that point. It ends the PAB process. Uh, the trial board again. The trial board is an administrative law judge. Um, it's pretty much always going to be an administrative law judge based on what we understand now. Uh, a civilian who's not member of the not a member of the administrative charging committee, so it can't be one of you, but it'll be a civilian appointed by the PAB, and then a police officer or deputy sheriff of equal rank to the person being accused of misconduct. And then all we have uh, next is we're looking at April 26th as the next date uh, for you guys to meet, and at that time we want to have a presentation from the sheriff and the police department to kind of show you how they'll present a case to you, so you'll understand like what that looks like when they come for you and what their process will be in presenting that case. At this point, we don't have any cases in the uh, in the pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good thing. Good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we want you guys to be you know active and involved. Uh, I guess the good thing is there are no cases at this time. I do have one question. Yes, sir. Um, if you don't mind. When we say an officer, we can request an officer to come before us. Is he being subpoenaed? Or is he going to show? What happens if he doesn't want to show before? Oh, um, so I let that wait for the. You can't subpoena. That. You have subpoena power. Mm -hmm. We have subpoena power. Um, there's probably a point which we're going to need to have a maybe a closed set. Right, I was just thinking about that discussion of of all the different machinations mm -hmm. about. Correct legal process to utilize. So, um, are you okay, kind of tabling that? Yeah, we'll table that okay. for now, okay. and we'll get back to it because we need to go in closed session for a couple of different things. So, what yeah. was your question? What if an officer refuses to show when you request him? Compels him to show in front of the PAB. Okay. Well, well I'm right. Oh, sure. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Steve. All right, Steve. All right, so if everyone's okay, I'm just going to do my presentation here because um, I want to use my laptop as well because I think. Oh, there's like what I should have said. Does anybody else have any questions? Sure. <laughs> Sean? No? Okay. You should know it by now. We will stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, the Open Meetings Act, or the OMA, as uh, it'll commonly be referred to by me, uh, is essentially a statute designed to promote governmental accountability. Uh, and it provides two, two rights, essentially, to the public. Uh, the right to know about a hearing um, and the right to attend it. Okay. So, the way it um, the way it sort of enacts that uh, goal is by requiring um, notice to the public when a public a quorum of a public body is going to meet uh, and meet as a legally defined term. So that has a, this has a few elements. The first is the body has to be a public body under the statute. Uh, that's at least it's an organization of at least two individuals created through law in any number of ways. Uh, the ACC is one under Comar. Uh, Comar explicitly makes the Open Meeting Act, Open Meeting Act applicable um, to ACC meetings with one large caveat concerning the actual deliberations. 
Um, so, but we'll get to that in a, in a second. The second element is a quorum. A uh, quorum is just a majority. I mean, obviously be three, uh, but Comer makes it clear that a quorum is three uh, for an, an ACC meeting. So, uh, what is a meeting? A meeting occurs when quorum meets to consider or transact public business. That distinction is important, uh, I think, for for you guys for two reasons. Uh, one is that it doesn't get triggered if uh, social encounter, chance encounter, it only gets uh, triggered when uh, public business is being discussed, uh, and it'll get triggered if there's circumstances that look like a government aid body was trying to circumvent the requirements, which won't be an issue here. Um, the other important consideration about a meeting is that it can, it can occur electronically. So, uh, if it can be Obviously, it can be a meeting, or in person, rather. It could be virtual over Zoom. Mm -hmm. It could be over the phone, group chat, or text messages, text messages or email if uh, they're exchanged uh, between a quorum and occur relatively close in time. It's good. Can't use these other media medium that sort of circumvent the requirement that all the discussions happen in public. Um, so basically, when a quorum meets, uh, we have to comply with uh, the Open Meeting Act's requirements. Uh, what are those administrative requirements? There are three big ones. Uh, one is notice. Uh, the requirement under the OMA is that the public uh, body give reasonable advance notice to include uh, the time, date, and place of the meeting and whether any part of it is expected to be closed. Uh, current law requires that uh, we keep a copy of that for three years. Second requirement is an agenda requirement. Uh, state law requires that an agenda be provided to the public. Um, it um, doesn't, well, it must be done when a notice is published if the uh, agenda items are known at that time. If they're not, um, which certainly might be the case with us, um, they must be added to the agenda or agenda created as soon as practicable. However, under um, the code, it can't be less than 24 hours under the state code before the meeting. And at, um, our county has a similar um, provision in its county code that requires at least three days. So three days at a minimum, notice has to be published. Um, it can be uh, via website, um, but the notice on the agenda, you know, can be disseminated through a a website that the public would and we'll use to access information with the board. Mm -hmm. However, we just need to give prior notice that we're going to be providing our notice and agenda <laughs> through the website. And it'll probably be done also through posting on the website. I'm not sure uh, that was done, but yeah, uh, it was. OK, yeah. so we so um, or really any other reasonable method is permissible. So um, the last of the three big administrative requirements is minutes. Um, so state law requires minutes, or the OMA requires minutes to be prepared as soon as practicable after each meeting. It must include uh, each item the body considered, mm -hmm. the action taken on each item, and the results of the vote. So I'm going to pull up, make sure I hit all of those, because I know Okay, so obviously this is just a minimum standard. If you guys want to do more or less, well, not less. If you guys want to do more, <laughs> you certainly can. Okay, uh, archive the live audio and video recordings of the meeting will satisfy this requirement. Um, and uh, the Howard County Code requires that minutes are provided to the public in at least one electronic medium. So. Um, it can't just be in a binder somewhere. Right. It has to be, you know, and that could be a scanned in, you know, link on a web, you know, scanned document link on a website. Okay. Um, but it has to be electronically available in at least one form. Um, so uh, closed sessions have at least one special requirement as far as minutes go. If there's a closed session, 
the minutes of the next open session must contain a statement of time, place, purpose of the closed session, a record of the vote for each member as to the closing of the session, um, a citation to the legal authority used to justify closing the session, mm -hmm. and a list of topics discussed, persons present, and each action taken during the session, I would say, our closed sessions for deliberative purposes are also subject to the confidentiality requirement under the statute uh, that is going to, uh, will restrict the amount of information that can be provided in those minutes about what was discussed, by mm -hmm. names, I mean, it's, confident, it's confidential, mm -hmm. right? So it'll be something like a uh, discussion of, you know. HR matters. H or, yeah. Uh, yeah, discussion of investigative uh, review of investigative files. So, okay. but, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be direct, um, complete. It just has to be uh, enough to explain enough what we are doing. What we were doing. But not too vague. Not yeah. Uh, not too vague. Not, not too vague, detailed. but not too detailed. So the regulations that imp that said that the ACC meetings were subject to the Open Meeting Act mm -hmm. also said that also say to ensure uh, confidentiality provided by statute, uh, the ACC must observe the closed session provisions. Um, and I'll touch on this in a second, but for at least for anything that would trigger confidentiality, those uh, requirements are mandatory that we go into a closed session. Um, so, Going to that topic, um, closed sessions are possible only in specific enumerated uh, reasons under the LMA. There are two that I flagged as particularly relevant. One is uh, to comply with a legal requirement, mm -hmm. which obviously uh, we have for the confidentiality with the confidentiality provision. Um, one one other reason uh, is to consult with counsel. Uh, now. That's ultimately discretionary, right? That's a, that that is always your decision. Um, but uh, it would, in either instance, I think a, a vote would need to happen. That being said, I don't think that at least for the deliberate deliberative portion about like reviewing investigative files, mm -hmm. uh, you can't do it without voting to go into a closed session, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, the, when a closed session is conducted, uh, there has to be a vote in open session, right? Um, and the written statement, um, has to be generated. Uh, the, it's basically, there needs to be a statement in writing that mirrors everything that has to get put on the record in the following open session that I described earlier. So there's basically two records that need to get generated right needs to go into the minutes of the next open session but also there's a written statement that's produced mm -hmm. uh, there's a form um i'm i don't know i'm sure the pab uh, has used it yeah plenty of time. okay yeah. and john has copies yeah so um and then that that needs to get uh retained for three years and posted on line um, but all the other sort of the content is the same um, as John mentioned, uh, at least before closed sessions conducted, at least one member has to have done the training. Uh, has yeah. Okay. We, I think we okay. Done okay. Yeah. Um, and at least one trained indiv individual must be present and um, must complete that compliance checklist that Kiana mentioned earlier. Um, that is. That's it as far as the OMA goes. Um, now, if you guys have any specific questions about it, again, I can provide you some more legal advice. Uh, if you have any hypotheticals you want to throw at me about the OM, OMA, there's obviously more in the statute, and this is sort of just a Okay. Uh, about the OMA. Um, at the training, it did reference to receive the materials. You can go on Attorney General's website. Do we happen to have some here that could be shared, or should we just go to the Attorney General's website? The just for record keeping purposes. Sure. The Attorney General's web website. Well, 
when you say for record keeping purposes, what are you specifically referring to? Oh, just to the referencing. Oh, like the, like the uh, what we trained on already. The AG's manual. Yes. Uh, I I like I have a copy for myself. I'm happy to give it to you. Oh, okay. Um, and beyond that, yes, you can go. I mean, it's, if if you Google, it's the first thing that oh. comes up. It's Principia. But if you want, I'll I'll always have a copy as well because it's handy. Oh yeah, that's copy to that. Sure. Uh, you want me to make copies of it? Yeah, I, I can. Um, or should we email it? I can you mean email to you and then you can yeah, PDF. Yeah. Well, that would yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't know. Um, but where's my computer? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I will email to you right now. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So, anybody have any questions? Sean, Chris, Sean. We gotta do some agenda items for next time. Yeah, we have. Does that date work for everybody? Yeah. 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 Oh, was it the twentieth? The twentieth. The, the last Wednesday of the um of April. Is the this is the twenty fourth? The fourth Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. far, it's the one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's one point I forgot to hit on. If I, if I may, so as far as the agenda goes, I'm sure this is. Uh, it's not a shadow. I mean, this is pretty obvious, but the consequence of that is it's we can't discuss anything that's not on the agenda. Right. right. So it's it, which is going to be difficult because it's a you know conversation occurs. Right. Right. Yeah. But it's 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 a pretty much a hard cap. Otherwise, there's no no purpose in having an agenda if you're not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can we revise the agenda once it's done if we feel that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But again, it, um, probably three days. Oh, that much time. Yeah. It, the agenda has to, the agenda has to be published at least three days. Yeah. So I have to have it on the website no later than if our meetings on the 26th and needs to be. Try the twenty third. So, so this which is <laughs> Sunday. So relatively the last working day would be the 21st. So there's no uh, flexibility for it. Let's say something comes up that was unexpected that needed to be handled. Like, can we add something to the agenda at the open meeting? Cool. Can the chair make a point of order to add to the agenda that then right. once once the chair makes the point of order, then we can vote and uh, amend the uh, meeting agenda at that time. Right. Um, so this might be a... Is that one that we need to go into closed session? It's, well, it's entirely up to you, but re this is legal. This is going to be legal advice if you guys okay. are comfortable so, doing it. I, I make a motion that we go into closed session to seek legal advice on adding to the agenda on emergency situations at the last minute. A second. All okay. in favor? Aye. 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 Put us in closed session, please, sir. All right. All right. Here's the back we are back in open session. Um, we came out of the little session at 7 o'clock um, to discuss legal advice from our attorney. And um, we are back on. Is there anything else? Yeah? Mm -hmm. No. Sean? Chris? Sean? Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move for adjournment. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>